Well, good afternoon. Um, I will talk about evaluating neural network models within a formal validation framework. This is work done by my colleagues and me at the research center in Jülich. And um, well, I will start at the very beginning with models. So what are they and uh, how can we learn from them? So as you certainly know, models are abstract, simplified description of some system of interest. And the key, uh, key attribute is that they can generate testable predictions. And when these models do this very accurately, we might want to infer our knowledge of the model to the system. This is called inductive inference and is good scientific practice. However, this doesn't mean that we actually uncovered some, some truth about the system. It just means that we found a useful description. Um, but how can we find out about useful descriptions and how can we decide which is the most useful? This is exactly where validation comes in. Validation is a process of uh, quantifiably um, evaluating the prediction accuracy with respect to the system of interest. But let's define it in a more broader modeling context. Um, this is a schematic you see about the modeling environment uh, with three key components. On the top you see the system of interest um, I already mentioned and to give a very simple example what this could be, this could be for example a ripe apple tree with falling apples. And by careful analysis and some theoretical considerations, uh, one might be able to construct the mathematical model of it, as Newton did. You see where I'm going with it. Um, the interesting part uh, of this is the explicit separation between the mathematical model and an executable model. The executable model is the part which can run simulations and actually do the predictions. Uh, for Newton's laws, it would be, for example, the standard physics engine. And this, of course, this code needs to be checked for correctness by a process called verification, and only a verified executable model can then be continued to be validated. The validation step uh, directly compares the simulation outcome to observations of the system of interest. And when the two match, well, we, we are in luck, we found a very useful model. Um, this, uh, this rather straightforward workflow enables us to compare and evaluate models and is therefore an indispensable part of simulation science. However, there are um, exceptions and additional aspects to consider, especially when the models become more complex. Um, I will brief briefly mention three of such aspects. First, um, well, assume you did a test and you got some result, and well, what now? Um, well, the result of a um, validation test is called a score, and the score tells you how much credibility you are allowed to place into your model. Um, but any single score, uh, score can never encapsulate all the features over the whole domain of interest of this model. Therefore, you need to employ many tests with different statistics and focusing on diff different features. Um, so this also uh, means that the score doesn't necessarily uh, directly tell you if a ta um, test passes or fails. This highly depends on the intention of the model. So, to, um, so in, the, in the ideal case, the model uh, knows a priori uh, what the acceptable agreement, so the range in which the score should lie, actually is and can formulate this. Um, to give a brief example, um, assume you have a spiking model and w with which you want to describe some data. And in case you were interested in only um, the rate profile, uh, you might be in luck because this matches quite nicely. However, if you were, when you created the model, rather focusing on the exact spike times, as for example, the latency of the first spike, you find a discrepancy and the resulting test would fail. And there might be an additional test, for example, the regularity of the spike intervals, which uncovers another discrepancy which is totally invisible to the first two tests. So you need many tests and you need to be aware of what you actually want to model. Um, secondly, in engineering, this is common practice to start at the very lowest level of um, simple building blocks, validate them, and then build on top of that to validate, validate the larger structures. However, this is not possible in neuroscience for, for several reasons. On the model side, we have all these different scales from ion channels, neurons, networks, up to behavior, and the relations between these are very complex and often unknown. And also on the data side, we don't have these kinds of multi-scale data available. Additionally, if you have, for example, a single cell model and validate it in some parameter regime, 
this might not necessarily be the parameter regime which the uh, neural model occupies in the network model. Therefore, the validity of the network model is not implied in the validity of the neural model. And also the other way around doesn't work. As for example, um, Potjens and Diesmann showed that um, the large scale network dynamics can be accurately modeled by, um, by a network model of simple leaky integrate and fire neurons, which are not very biologically detailed. And um, also beyond this conceptual framework, you might face additional considerations in practice when doing validation. For example, if you want to validate a model, um, uh, you might lack an appropriate data set uh, fitting to that model um, to come to a strong conclusion. And these cases can be very helpful to validate not against data, but against another model, which is more trusted. Um, or also uh, validate against the same model, but in a different version or a mutant of this model. Um, this might be helpful to, um, to quantify the influence of uh, little changes as, as, for example, the underlying neuron model or the solver for the ordinary differential equations. One of these changes can also be uh, the choice of the simulator engine you use. And I will come to, back to this precise example later on. So, um, but how could a software tool look like which actually uh, reflects these different aspects and uh, is versatile enough to adapt to the different challenges uh, specific workflows can have. So the first thing uh, you do when you develop a, a tool, you look, out, you look um, if there's already something like it out there. And in this case, indeed, there is. There's a Python package sci unit, which uh, provides a general framework for validating um, scientific models. So our tool, network unit, for network-level validation of neuroscientific models, builds directly on top of that and also uses the implemented electrophysiology um, analysis methods provided by the open source project Elephant. So let me show you the structure of this tool. So the key components are the data and the model. The model is, um, is a class object which uh, is able to run the simulation and if Newton would have been into coding, this is what, what he would have written. Um, the data um, would be our measurements of uh, the falling apple. And the corresponding test could, for example, be a falling velocity test, which, uh, measures, uh, which uh, tests the velocity of the apple after a given distance. The test is also uh, a class object, which is able to compute the velocity from uh, the model simulation and then compute the corresponding score in comparison to the data. Um, this score is not only the quantify it, um, quantified result of the test, but also this object contains all the information of the test and the model to help with the interpretation of the result and also to ensure its uh, reproducibility. Well, besides reproducibility, another design object um, here was modularity. So um, uh, aspects of the test, like the type of score used, the statistic, is not hard-coded into the test, but attached via a separate object. And also the parameters used uh, are attached separately. So um, that consequently, there exists a more general test class um, which uh, is agnostic about score type and parameters and can be reused for different variations of this test. This would be a general falling test here. And scientists might be interested in um, having even a more general test uh, or, and, um, measure, uh, and evaluating the velocity of an apple when thrown horizontally. So there can be a more general base test which handles all movement uh, with arbitrary initial conditions. And this is an effort uh, of uh, writing no calculation twice so that everything depends on the same calculations. Um, for network neuroscience, this could be, for example, and as, as it is implemented in network unit, uh, one base test is, um, handles all the calculation of correlations. A child test um, of this can then, um, for example, uh, compare directly the, um, the distribution of correlation coefficients and uh, Another child test could instead use these correlation coefficients, build a graph, have, a, have further child tests, which then test um, uh, graph centrality measures. And although these are very different tests, they necessarily agree on uh, the definition of, of correlations because they use the exact same code. Finally, um, this framework also makes sure that the test actually makes sense and checks whether this model can produce the property, in this case movement, 
uh, the test wants to evaluate. And indeed, uh, this framework proves versatile enough to uh, also incorporate the, the practice of validating one model with another model. Simply by inheriting one dedicated test class, we can use the same test to uh, not test against data, but, but against model. And the test is actually formally equivalent. For our Apple example, this could be, for example, a relativistic model of motion. And uh, here we can um, identify the limitations of Newton's law uh, without having to actually measure superfast apples. OK, um, let's jump directly so, to a real world application. So this is in the context of, of a reproduci reproducibility study of the polychronization net, uh, model, which was published in 2006 by Itzikiewicz. And this model is interesting for at least two reasons. Um, the first one is it uh, produces a very rich uh, network dynamics of spatial, temporary, organized, and repeating spike patterns. Um, but the second reason is arguably, arguably more important. Um, Itzikiewicz actually published also his code, which made it possible to reproduce it. Um, so first study uh, focused on the exact reproduction of this model, um, here using the uh, engine Nest. This was worked by Pauli and Weidel, and they discussed the model specifications which are necessary to, um, to actually do such an exact reproduction. And in parallel, we worked on porting this model to the neuromorphic hardware system um, called Spinnaker. And uh, a neuromorphic hardware uh, uses uh, very different um, kinds of computation than a conventional computer and a conventional simulator. So, so an exact reproduction is out of the question. So um, we necessarily needed to uh, employ validation techniques to be able to uh, somehow quantitatively compare this to the original simulation, which was, by the way, written in some custom C code. So uh, one study uh, focused on the implementation details and the verification techniques, and the second study on the validation techniques to compare this to the original study. And I will show a few points of what we learned here. So we started off by very naively porting this system, uh, this model, to the neuromorphic hardware system using all the default settings. And you see in the very first line the spiking activity, um, which we uh, obviously had to improve on. And we did this in, in two iterations, you see in two and three, um, by tweaking the solver for the, for the ordinary differential equations, um, which improved a lot. And by I, you already see that the third iteration looks way more similar uh, to the original implementation uh, simulation in C. But uh, it's very hard to see by I if this is a good reproduction or not. So already at this early stage of the um, development of this implementation, we used validation tests. Here you see again three rows for the three uh, different iterations and three columns for three different tests, um, focusing on the feature of firing rates, regularity, uh, measured by the LV, the local coefficient of variation, um, and the correlation coefficient. And this uh, we quantified with an effect size, so the distance between the two um, uh, distributions. And here we could actually quantify that each iteration got more similar to the, to the C simulation. However, this is still not a good agreement. So. Um, to, to jump to the very end of, of the story, uh, we further dove into the model and approved upon the temporal resolution and the algorithm for the threshold detection algorithm and, um, and arrived here. Um, here we have a better fit of firing rates for the RV, also for the correlation coefficient. Um, and we introduced three more additional tests to have a more complete picture. The interspike intervals, the rate correlation, and the eigenvalues of the rate correlation matrix. Um, so at this stage, we, we can say, OK, we were able to qualitatively reproduce this model on the neuromorphic hardware and quantify the level of agreement by these effect sizes. However, this is not a strong statistical agreement. There are still discrepancies here, most obvious in the, in the higher firing rates and slightly higher correlations. Um, and although these differences might be small, they can have potentially a very large uh, effect on the occurrence of spatial temporal patterns. So um, this should illustrate that um, all the upside validation testing can have even beyond the standard scenario of, of uh, comparing model and experimental data. 
So um, to take a, take a step back, uh, I want I'll give some broader context where we are going with this. Um, so in with the network unit, we mostly focused so far on measures um, quantifying, characterizing the network activity based on um, pairwise and single measures of spiking activity. And we are now starting um, of also integrating measures um, corresponding to the spatial dynamics of, of networks. Here, for example, as you see in an LFP recording of an, implement, um, of an implanted electrode array which shows wave-like behavior of the activity. Um, also, I really have to mention that uh, there are many other tools like it specialized for certain validation scenarios, for, as for example, Neuron Unit, which handles the, um, the single cell validations. And, they all, um, and it's aimed to harmonize these efforts. Um, especially um, also uh, as they should be integratable with the uh, validation framework of the HPP, uh, which is which basically provides a searchable database of uh, models uh, and tests and scores. So um, to wrap this up, um, three points you really should take away from this talk. Um, first, validation is important. Uh, any simulation without quantification is, is just guesswork. And there are tools out there like Network Unit and many others to help with it. So you can make use of them. And third, um, if you uh, run validation tests, please use more than just one test. And even if there's not, not enough data, you can use other models to evaluate your model. So, and with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and all my wonderful collaborators. And if you want to dig deeper into this topic, um, there's a poster on the simulator comparison study. And there's also a, a demo on SciUnit by the developer, Richard Gerken. Um, and well, with this, I would like to thank you again. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, questions? How did you go about tweaking your model? <laughs> well, um, I think there's no general um, recipe of how to tweak a model. You really have to dig deep inside and understand the model. And uh, gladly, we had uh, collaborators who um, well, could very well understand the model and also the, um, the underlying uh, structure of the, of the neuromorphic hardware and could, uh, were able to find out the discrepancies um, where um, some, some dynamic in the model can't be represented in the, in the hardware system. And there we then um, dig deeper to, to um, identify these mismatches um, and, for example, found that um, uh, the temporal resolution initially um, um, chosen by the model uh, um, of the polychronization model um, doesn't work on this neuromorphic hardware. And so we had to go to a finer time resolution for the, at least for the integration of the membrane potentials. So uh, in this case, you had a fully defined simulation to, as your reference. Yes. Suppose your reference was a bunch of noisy data, experimental <laughs> data. Yeah. Um, so this is, of course, always a problem. Uh, data is uh, variable, as we know, and um, a model fitting to one pair of data might not fit to another pair of data. Um, so as I showed, um, it's able, um, we are able to compare two models, and, but we are also able to compare two data sets and actually quantify the variability within these, mod uh, within these data sets. Um, and this can be helpful to define this acceptable agreement I mentioned where, where we could expect uh, the model, uh, how, um, how accurate we could expect the model to be. Thank you. Um, the uh, network unit, the, the tests that you have there now, um, so like, just to step back for a second, in single cell studies, I think people have been thinking a lot about what are the features of uh, a spike train, what are the features of the memory potential that they might want to look at and put into an optimization and put into some sort of validation of a model. And it, uh, in, for network models, I think that's not, from the, you know, the amount of time people have been working on the science of that has not been uh, super well established. And I know in network you, know, you have seven or eight made main things that you test, like you showed in the slides comparing the models. W what else looking forward do you think people should be um, 
asking about when they're trying to validate network models that beyond that? Like, what are some future tests you could see in network unit that would be ways of looking into whether or not two models are similar, or whether a model is a good representation of, of the system? Yep. Um, well, there are several aspects of, to, to this question. Um, first, um, this um, highly depends on the intended use of the model, what you want to test, and what are the important features, and which features you might want to neglect. Um, as for example, in the example, if, if you only are interested in rates, you, you don't care for some spike regularity or latency. Um, uh, another aspect um, is um, related to the variability uh, in data. Um, um, is you want, probably want to uh, identify uh, features of the model uh, which are fairly stable across data sets and don't vary uh, too much. And uh, these would be the features you want to focus on, which again might uh, be different for, for different species um, or different kind of, of data. Um, So, um, yes, this certainly can be expanded upon those me measures and probably should be. Um, so uh, one, one aspect of this is certainly graph measures, which uh, can be employed uh, independent of uh, what the underlying uh, weight measure is, if it's this correlation or functional con connectivity or maybe causality. Um, and uh, it's certainly very useful to then um, explore the, the graph measures of, of these uh, kinds of activity measures. I hope this answers the question. Okay. okay. If there are no further questions, uh, then let's uh, thank Robin again. <laughs>